Hey guys, I'm Chris. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. We do hope you had a very merry and safe holiday. That's right. Um, whatever holiday you celebrate, we hope that it was good. And we really appreciate you guys uh, waiting through our little holiday hiatus. It's something that we've never done before. But so. just keep in mind, you're the lucky ones because you assholes are in 2021 right now. And we're still in 2020. <laughs> We hope that your first few days of 2021 were magical and, um, I don't know, disaster-free? Yeah. We hope it's everything that we've always dreamed it to be. I don't know about you, Chris, but I have some pretty high expectations for 2021. I mean, like, 2020 was so bad. I just don't want to be a dumpster fire. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, we could really only go up from here, so it doesn't matter. I mean, like, terrible things can happen, but it can't be near as bad. Give me a national fire, you know, maybe a protest or two. Just, you know, get rid of the pandemic, at least. I do have an interesting question. Oh, what's up? Would you rather have four more years of pandemic or four more years of Trump? Oh, my God. What a horrible <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I mean, do you want my real answer? <laughs> Let's leave it for the audience. <laughs> let us know. Listeners, let us know your preference. <laughs> Uh, I'm certainly counting down the days to January the 20th. I know that. Do you uh, have any New Year's resolutions? Do I? No. (laughs) (laughs) I resolve to have more fun. Survive. Yes. Get the vaccine. (laughs) To live. Uh, We've only just begun to live. (laughs) So, um, it's time to shoot the flames. We haven't even said that yet, right? Yeah. So, uh, That's what we're doing. So, we are here to have our monthly little chat show where we talk about, uh, you know, horror news and trailers, if there are any, and um, reviews and comments and questions from you, our listener. That's right. First up, normally we mention our reviews, but we have had a dearth, a complete lack of reviews for the last what three months now yeah our last review was posted on september the 20th holy crap that's uh october november and december with no reviews yeah we're starting to feel a little unloved yeah so if any of you guys have not done that yet that is one way you could easily help us is by going over to apple itunes or apple podcasts and leaving us a review you don't have to be an itunes user you can download you know, iTunes on your desktop, even if you have a PC or whatever, and just do it real quick. Also, you can leave reviews on Facebook, like they have a space for that. And um, even just a tweet, you know, like we'll we'll read it on Shooting the Flames. So, yeah. But we do have some comments from our episodes. So, uh, Chris, do you want to go ahead and read the first one? Sure. The first one is from Shooting the Flames back in December. And Michael from Patreon said, Regarding Constantine 2, the Keanu movie was fine, but since they have perfectly cast the role of John Constantine with Matt Ryan, who has been playing the character for a few years now on TV, season one of his own show, and many appearances on various DC shows, Matt Ryan is one of those born-to-play actors with a specific role. Keanu was Constantine in name only, whereas Matt Ryan checked off every last BBB box, British Blonde Bisexual. Seriously, look up Matt Ryan and you'll see how perfect he is as JC. We were talking a little bit about this offline, and I and I know that you're really passionate about this. Honestly, I feel like we're lucky just to have Constantine in a movie period, right? So I'm really not that picky personally, right? I mean, and as far as I mean, Constantine is famous um, as far as his like universe and his and his private adventures and things like that. But as far as like DC universe goes, he's kind of like Kathy Griffin life on the D list. You know what I mean? (laughs) So uh, I think we're lucky to have him in a movie period. So honestly, I wouldn't count Keanu off, especially since I actually did enjoy the first uh, Constantine movie. I said when we talked about it, I was going to rewatch it and it is on my watch list to review because I I haven't seen it since it was first released onto DVD low those many years ago. Um, Is he supposed to be bisexual? Is that part of his character? Yeah. I did not know this. So I... Um, not that it colors my opinion of him in any way whatsoever, but um, he has sex with demons. I mean, how, oh. how, how hard is a dick after after a demon? I would assume fiery. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would assume very. <laughs> should have been your answer. <laughs> very hard. <laughs> uh, I don't know who Matt Ryan is. I don't know what he looks like. Um, Blonde, stubble, grizzly, British. That sounds kind of hot. I mean, but. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, isn't John Constantine supposed to be part of uh, what's what's the DC version of Avengers? Justice League. No, not really. No, Justice League Dark. They're making a movie called Justice League Dark. And maybe I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, but whatever. I, it's DC. Is that right though? Is this Justice League? I'm, I'm more of a Marvel guy myself. I could take a both or leave them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like you look at something like Endgame versus like the latest Wonder Woman movie, and you know, it's looking like a <laughs> I don't know a stick of platinum versus a pile of shit. So I mean, it's across the board. I've only heard terrible things about. Anyway, that movie, we so. digress. This is not a just horror a discussion, bit. is it? Well, I mean, a horror adjacent. But we also got a comment from Nicole on Patreon from our Shooting the Flames episode in December, and she says, Robert. Several years ago, when I still lived in L.A., I had to help my nephew with one of those Flat Stanley projects, so I took it over to the Kodak Theater. There was a little mini-museum-type display set up since the Oscars were approaching, and I got to hold one. It is every bit as fun as you might imagine. Also, they are very heavy, so I have to assume that they will have a similar display at the new museum. Nicole, words cannot describe... How incredibly jealous that I am. I mean, like, I just, it is a fervent dream of mine to hold an Oscar. I mean, I would like to hold one that I've won, but that's probably not going to happen unless they do like Oscars for podcasting, which we are shoe in. Um, <laughs> but I want to hold an Oscar. And so, like, yeah, we're like, we're planning a trip to LA as soon as it's safe to do so when the museum opens. And when I get to that city, I will hold an Oscar and maybe find a way to like sneak it out. From our Flamers flashback of Noah over on Patreon, Janice said, Yes, we saw Noah when it came out and were amazed at the non-acceptance to even think or discuss among Christians. Some would not go see the movie. We thought it made us think and want to reread the story in the Bible, which we did and discussed. Um, You know, actually, when we watched Noah, I kind of was interested to go back and like read. I didn't I didn't pick up my Bible and like do it. But I mean, I it really intrigued me to see exactly what was written and what was said in the Bible. And I'm still sort of intrigued by that. I just need to figure out where my Bible is. (laughs) I think somewhere in my house. Sean, the (laughs) non-believer. From our deep dive into Night of the Comet, which was our Christmas episode this year, at Dr. Butcher MD2 said, It took me years to get around to seeing this, and I was genuinely surprised at how sharp it is. I didn't have any assumptions, but the performances are surprisingly strong and endearing. Here, here. We really enjoyed Night I of the Comet. Completely agree with you. Those performances are great. Those two women in that movie are fantastic. I cannot stop saying such good things about that movie. Yeah. And for me, it was a first time watch versus you. You'd seen it many times mm-hmm. before, but I was just um, was blown away how nostalgic I was, even though I had never seen it before. <laughs> for the first time. That's yeah. pretty good, though. I mean, like if it makes you feel nostalgic the first time you watch it, I think that they're really doing something right. And uh, at Nicole and MCD from Instagram said, you know, I'm excited about this one. Your biggest fan who just turned five is getting a huge early Christmas present during the next car ride. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, several shooting the flames ago. She's the one who says that uh, they she plays it in the car with them and they like the story or synopsis. So they make up their own ghost stories right around it. She also went and commented after this one on Instagram and she said that they she, they call us the news. <laughs> So, <laughs> oh, no, maybe that was on Patreon. I can't remember. She said, like, they, li- they listen to the news. We're the news. <laughs> I love that. Without Huey Lewis. <laughs> we got a comment on our deep dive on white noise uh, from Nikki on Patreon. So this was an episode that we released back in September. And she said, we watched it. I always enjoy Michael Keaton, so I'm glad we did. It didn't scare me, but I feel like I have to prepare myself for older scary movies. There have been so many advances in movie making that I have to remind myself that at the time it was released, it made more of an impact. Thanks for helping me expand my catalog of horror. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't think of White Noise as an older movie. Like, you yeah. Know? But it came out in like 2004 or something, 2003 or something like that. And I'm just like, now compared to that is like the same as, you know, watching a movie in 1990 or from, you know, in 2005 Mm -hmm. or watching a movie um, from, you know, 1980 and 1995. You know, that's what it feels like to some people watching White Noise now for the first time. And I'm just like, that blows my mind how how quickly time passes as you get older i guess like 
Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, because I mean, time is a little like different the older you get, and so I don't, I don't really consider White Noise to be an older movie either, just because I was already adult when it came out. I think is the the reason why. I remember whenever she made this comment and we were talking about it off mic, you said, "Well, if White Noise were a person that could have a baby now or something like that," (laughs) so I mean, that much time has passed. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, time is relevant, but um, I don't. I mean. That unborn child of Michael Keaton's gonna be driving around right now, <laughs> unhinged. Ah, I see what you did there. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm glad that you liked it. I'm glad that you watched it. Um, and you know, from time to time, we do deep dive into older movies. I think this is one of the first times that we really like did something squarely in the new millennium, right? We did Dawn of the Dead. Oh, you're right, and we did Cabin Fever. Yeah, yeah. So we've done a few. So strike that. You know, and we've done much, much, much older movies than that. Obviously, right. Fatal Attraction, mm-hmm. Rosemary's Baby. Everything else we've everything done. Everything else we've done. <laughs> <laughs> Jurassic Park, Jaws, Poltergeist. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, whatever. Who cares? I wonder at what at what point do I have to call myself old, right? I mean, like. It's relative. Yeah. Now, I guess. Yeah. So I need to start calling myself old. When you get your AARP card, I guess. God, it's fast approaching. Shit. Next Think of all the discounts, though. Oh, my God. I'm looking forward to senior citizen discounts. <laughs> Hotel stays will never be the same. You've got, you've got a couple more decades. <laughs> but speaking of open questions, um, <laughs> at home, Rig Sean said, at the Film Flamers, I have questions after your outtakes episode. So the lady hid the vibrator in a paper towel tube in the bathroom and would use it? Or did she just throw it away at work because she didn't want people to home at home to see? No, she was using it. Yeah, clearly. I mean, like, if she wanted to throw it away, we have, like, many, many covered trash cans throughout yeah. the place where we work, right? So she could have just thrown it away. Like, she was using it, and she hid it in that paper towel tube. Yeah. So, um... She was she was using company time to diddle a skittle. That's... <laughs> so, um, guys, if y'all haven't listened to our latest outtakes episode, which we released on Christmas Day, go back and do that because you will sort of like put the pieces together and understand what at home Rick Sean was asking. So, yeah, it's a funny story. We have a new patron. We do. That's right. So we need to welcome DW to the Patreon family. That's right. We have dozens of patrons now. That's right. And three that we need to call out specifically. Well, almost dozens. (laughs) Dozens plural. (laughs) Almost dozens plural. (laughs) Um, Benjamin G, Amber C, and Penelope N are patrons at the Film Flamer or Higher tier. So we shout them out in every episode. So thank you, DW. Thank you to all of our patrons for your continued support. We hope that you're enjoying our content over there. If you want to join the family and check out some of our bonus episodes, head over to patreon.com slash the Film Flamers. And join the family. That's right. Horror News. So we found out that Mike Flanagan and Netflix have no plans for making more of the haunting of seasons, like the haunting of Hill House or the haunting of Bly Manor, which I'm fine with, really. Yeah, I mean, I think like the exact headline of this article was never say never, which is what he said. So um, somebody tweeted at Mike Flanagan and asked, you know, what are the plans for the next haunting of season? And he said there are currently none. Never say never. Yeah. But you know what? He's doing all sorts of other things. You know, Uh, he wants to make movies. He's making other show concepts. Like, let's not marry him to a specific, you know, high concept. If he has a great idea, let let him do it. If he wants to return to this in, you know, two to five years. Great. I'm sure he will. You know, Mm -hmm. but until then, just like let his creativity fly, because I think boxing him in a little bit. This was maybe a little bit too much of a business deal to continue the haunting of with Bly Manor because he only directed the first episode versus the first season he directed all of them. That's true. You know, so I feel like he was getting less and less committed and wanting to do his, you know, tell his own stories, build his own worlds, uh, or at least, you know, steal Stephen King's. (laughs) And I I think it's good to remember as well that I mean, you don't have to do these things year after year. Like you said, come back to it four or five years later. I mean, if we've learned from American Horror Story, if you continue on with something and you just try to make it, sometimes it's not as good. 
you know? And yeah. so I would rather them wait until they had a good piece of literature to, to base something on. Right. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, our next piece of news is that Mike Flanagan wrapped his filming of midnight mass up in Canada, which is also going to be a Netflix series, which he directed every single episode of. There we go. And even during the time of COVID, they did it so incredibly safely that no one, no one in the cast, no one in the crew caught COVID. Like they just went there, they got the job done, got it done safely, and they're ready to, you know, start editing and get it out there for us. Yeah. So. And he said it was the best production he'd ever been on. That's and right. Everyone kind of agreed with that. The vibe was so positive. And everyone was, they like had absolutely no problems with everything. And other productions were trying to like ask how they did it and everything mm-hmm. else. And so, um, the feeling, the vibe is like, it's super, super happy and positive and they're, they're all very proud of what they've done. So I'm really, really looking forward to, to seeing this. Me too. And I mean, a lot of the cast of midnight mass is coming from, you know, the haunting of series. I mean, Mike Flanagan, like, you know, like, like other directors likes to work with the same cast over and over again. He, and you know, <clears throat> I like that. Cause you think directors build a rapport with these actors and, um, like he's already said that like certain people that he's worked with many times, like this, these are the best performances they've done as far as he's concerned. So yeah. I think this was a big passion project for him and I'm super looking forward to seeing it because I like anything that Mike Flanagan does really. So our next bit of horror news is that David Gordon Green is reportedly in talks to direct the, an exorcist sequel for Blumhouse. And I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Now he's brought us the latest Halloween movies, which mm-hmm. are very good, but I'm of the opinion that I feel like we need a little bit more of an art house aesthetic director to do an exorcist film. You know, I'd like to see, you know, like a Robert Eggers exorcism. Oh my gosh. Yes. You know, like I I don't know if this is the right guy for that, but you know, we'll see. Well, I mean, so when news broke earlier this year that there was going to be an exorcist movie, it was uh, thought to be like a reboot or a remake kind of situation which I think a lot of people were on the fence about. And now that he's attached to it, he's calling it a sequel, a direct sequel to the exorcist. And I think that we've learned that he likes to go and, you know, sort of erase other sequels like he did for Halloween, Hmm. which he could do for the exorcist. What a heretic. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, but it's not that funny. No, it really is. (laughs) Because that's like the fucking worst Exorcist movie. <laughs> <laughs> I like it though. <clears throat> um, yeah, but I don't like. I don't. You can't erase these movies. You know, I, they become part of canon or whatever. I will still watch it. You know, but I don't know. I kind of have to agree with you. I don't think he's the right choice for The Exorcist. It needs to be someone a little bit more understated. I was thinking like Robert Eggers or the guy that did uh, is doing the new Dune. Um, also did um, Blade Runner 2049. Yeah, and Denis Villeneuve, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that would be good. I mean, because uh, he's like skirting horror adjacency, right, mm, with yeah. the movies that he makes. But yeah, it needs to be... Like, The Exorcist is such a quiet story itself. And if you're going to do a direct sequel, especially if you're going to discount, you know, the heretic at all Mm -hmm. then you you need to do it quietly not that friedkin is like a a, he's not like a kubrick you know he's real fucking close he was shooting guns and shit on the set of the exorcist to get reactions from people you know what i mean i'm talking about aesthetic i'm not talking about (laughs) mannerisms i'm talking about like the way they make movies my god i can't imagine like being on set for a beat his actresses too (laughs) or that is not what i'm talking about (laughs) kubrick movies my god put through hell so, I mean, I don't know. I love The Exorcist so, so much that I like the idea of a remake sort of like makes my skin crawl and a sequel too, really. But I mean, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I'll probably still watch it anyway. Yeah. What's next? So, and I'm sure that all of you have seen this because it was a pretty big announcement as far as like movie fans and movie releases in general go that Warner Brothers is planning to release their entire slate of 2021 films. Yeah. On HBO Max, day and date, as a theater for 30 days. And of course, this has caused a lot of backlash with the creators. I mean, I think that's good for watchers, right? I mean, because I I have HBO Max. I got it for free with my internet package or whatever, and I will probably continue it because there's lots of good horror that's in the Warner Brothers 2021 slate. Things like The Conjuring 3 and James Wan's new movie Malignant is part of it. And I'm more interested in what those people have to say versus like the people that have the loudest voices, like Christopher Nolan, for one. Yeah. 
He's like, I went to, to bed at night thinking I was working for the best studio on earth. And I woke up realizing that I worked for the worst or something. And I'm just like, whatever, you know, if someone sneezes in Dolby Atmos, Christopher Nolan's going to have a hissy, <laughs> you know? So it's just like, let's, you know, let's tone it down and, and listen to some of the other voices. It'll be interesting to see in this whole new world, you know, what gets to the most people. And obviously if they want more eyes on their you know, on their, on their projects and their art, then streaming is definitely the way to go. But I think some of these people, especially Denis Villeneuve, who came out and said he didn't think it was a great idea is because he's got such a huge tentpole movie with mm-hmm. Dune and a lot's riding on it to make the other half of the movie essentially. Cause he's cutting the story in two to tell it, you know, the right way or outside of like a mini series, you know, I so mean, he's worried that it's not going to make his money back obviously to the studio and that he's just going to be cut off and that no more big tentpole movies can be made. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. I, I think that eventually people will go back to the theater. The theater business is not lost unless they just can't survive and they all have to shutter. Right. But I don't know. I think that, I think there was a trajectory towards streaming anyway, before COVID people were starting to watch movies from home more often. And, and even I, who used to enjoy going to the movie theater a lot, over the last like 10 years had stopped. I just don't enjoy it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like there's too many people. They're all loud. I never have a good experience and I would wait to watch movies at home. Right. I have no problem spending $20 to rent a movie, which I think, you know, maybe Warner should have done right. Like release these as early access on Amazon prime or something like that. I'll, I'll pay 20 bucks to, to rent and stream a movie. Um, but I think this is a good thing. I think it's a good thing for people and movie watchers. Um, not that we had a dearth of movies in 2020. Like I got to see quite a bit of stuff. Oh yeah. You know, but I, I think it's good for people, especially in a time like this to be able to see movies. Like there were so many things that I was so ready to watch in 2020. That's been pushed back indefinitely that we don't even know when it's going to see the light of day. If ever. Right. Oftentimes movies will get shelved. Like, the fucking new mutants no, for, for years, years and years, yeah. you know? And so like, yeah, I really want to see the new candy man, but if they keep pushing it back, who knows when it's going to be released. So. Yeah. And honestly, we need to come up with a new way to count the, you know, count the coffers per se, as far as these movie releases go for streaming. And it needs to be a little bit more public because each one is, you know, Netflix and everything else famously keep these numbers very, very close to the chest. Yeah. Right. So that they don't have to, you know, compete as openly. And if they make a risk, they don't get trounced for it. Like, you know, John Carter would be very publicly at the theater. You know, those are very public numbers because all the theaters, you know, say how much money they made. Right. And so Disney can get kind of trounced in the media or XYZ studio can get trounced in the media if they make a risk. And so when that happens, we get less and less independent new ideas and everything's like sure bets. Yeah. And if I feel like streaming is a really good place, maybe not as high budget sometimes, but that's I'm getting proven wrong all the time on that. Well, yeah. You know? I mean, if you look at like, like I haven't watched Mink yet, right? The new Fincher movie on Netflix, but I've, I've read really good things. It seems like he had a good budget on that. And Netflix is really like spending the money to go and get good talent to make good movies. You know, mm-hmm. this is just a situation where these movies have already been made for the most part. And instead of, I mean, they're still going to go to the theater. It, they're they're going to make money. And honestly, the biggest money right now is not tentpole movies. No. But it's being committed to shows. Mm-hmm. Amazon very famously just committed close to I think two billion dollars on one show. Jesus, really? Before they've even made one season. And that's the new Lord of the Rings show that's going to be coming out in 2021. Well of course that would cost a lot of money. But they of course had to buy the rights from the Tolkien estate to do it for 250 million. And then they had to make a five year commitment as part of that deal. And so each show, each season is going to be 10 to 20 episodes and each season costs X amount of money. So that's close to $2 billion that they've committed themselves to. That's crazy. You know, and other shows are almost as expensive, you know? So it's just, it's interesting to see as this evolves. And we've been talking about streaming versus theater um, before the pandemic for years, ever since we started the podcast and before, obviously we've been talking about it, you know, because it's on everyone's mind. Obviously streaming is the future. 
period. Yeah, and I know the Academy changed their rules this year, right, because of the pandemic. And they were like, if, if it, it was streaming on a platform, it is eligible for an Oscar, right? Which is something that Steven Spielberg made a huge <clears throat> fit about last year, you know, like making sure that they were shown in the theater for a specific amount of time in order to, you know, get the credit they needed to be involved in the Academy. But yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's the future. And obviously, you know, we need to have access to movies. And I, th- I think that's good. I think I also remember like when Spotify first became a thing or streaming music became a thing, like there was also a sort of a big uproar in the music community about how we're going to get the money for the you know product that we create and how's it going to work out right and here we are you know like 10 years later and streaming music is the new norm yeah they're going to fight against the fight against the fight against it because they're fighting for their lives yeah right all like amc all these theaters this is their lifeblood and of course they're going to fight for it we should expect them to as corporations and as job you know sources of jobs etc but for me, theater going now is still a thing, you know, like if there's a big event and I want to see it or if I want to go with a, a larger group of friends or if I'm already out or if I just want to get out of the house, mm-hmm. you know, things like Alamo Draft House where they have like a curated pre-show, you know, really great drinks and really great food, you know, and then they also have very comfortable environments. Generally speaking, even though, you know, there's people in there that are just making fools of themselves still overall, I still like to go to the theater. You know, and I'm sad that I haven't been able to during this pandemic and I will go again, but streaming is the future. <laughs> <laughs> but even Alamo Drafthouse did smart things like they were offering streaming movies. You know, you could go and like rent a movie from the Alamo Drafthouse and watch it. And they had some older things, like curated things to watch. I was also going to be doing some really interesting things to pop culture because things like the artists that were only in theaters, you know, you know, uh, or just like more smaller movies, you know, that were just in theater releases or whatever are not going to be accessible to everyone up front you know, for streaming and it's just going to get way more eyes on things. And I think that's going to kind of equalize things and it's going to change the way we consume entertainment and what we're interested in as a, you know, as a culture. And I think that's really interesting to watch. I completely agree with you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens, especially in 2021. So, um, you know, with that being said, the one thing that I haven't done in this pandemic is go see a movie and I've always wanted you could like rent the entire theater out now for like a hundred bucks and have 20 people come watch a movie. And I'm like, that seems like a really safe way to watch something. So, I mean, maybe what I think is interesting is that out of any genre, horror has been the one that's least shy about releasing straight away mm-hmm. on streaming, com- you know, you, compared to drama or fantasy, sci-fi, all those that try and really like hold out for a big release or whatever. Horror is just like, fuck it. Yep. We're going to do it. And so I feel like, you know, without this pandemic, there'd be a lot less horror f- fans, new horror fans, and a lot less eyes on the horror movies that we've enjoyed this year than otherwise would have been. Yeah. I mean, and I, I know that we have a uh, a year end episode coming up. Right. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about some of the like the big stories from horror this year. Things like The Wretched, which, you know, was number one at the box office all those weeks in a row. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, like horror really did like have a big name for itself in 2020. And rightfully so. It's the kind of year that you would flock to a horror movie or like grasp onto it. But I mean, I also think that 2020 is going to bring us good horror to come oh i completely agree if 2020 was any anything to any hint at things to come i think that you know we're in a good place right now culturally with horror yeah lots of horror movies about diseases coming our way i'm sure we'll see well also just like last month i think we had talked about one trailer last month and it was for halloween kills and uh, there just hasn't been any good horror trailers for us to talk about. So we're missing that in this shooting the flames too. But if you guys have seen something that looks interesting, a new horror trailer, send it our way, send us a link so we can watch it and talk about it in the next shooting the flames episode. Yes. But I think that just about wraps up our discussion for this month's short shooting the flames episode. Yeah, it does. But that's okay because we have a lot of content coming out for you in January. We used our hiatus to get ready for our two deep dive episodes this month on The Shining and Doctor Sleep. 
and we will be covering the director's cut of Doctor Sleep. So prepare thyself. I believe it is available for streaming as well as buying on Blu-ray. And I think it's better. I think you can actually watch it on HBO Max. I think they the director's have, cut. I think they have the director's cut and the regular one. Well, look for that director's cut, and if you can't find it, then the, the original is just fine. We both rated it five stars back in 2019. Mm-hmm. This is one of the first films that we've done a hot take on that we will be covering so soon in a deep dive. That's right. So we're very excited about that. Also, look forward to our best of 2020 lists coming out. I believe next week. That's right. Um, so uh, we want to know what some of your favorite horror movies for 2020 was. So go ahead and let us know on social media. You can do that at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or you can call our hotline. Please send us a voicemail. We love you. 972 666 7733. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why it was so funny to me. <clears throat> and then hang up that phone and leave us a review. <laughs> <laughs> and over on Patreon, we're going to have another poll to pick the Flamers flashback. So like we said earlier, head over to patreon.com slash the film Flamers and check all of that out. It's been 87 years <laughs> <laughs> since our last review. <laughs> well, happy new year, guys. And until next time, sweet, sweet dreams. I hope at least 2021 lasts 50 years instead of 87. Jesus Christ. I don't know. It seems like like the first part of 2020 lasted forever, but the last half of it like zoomed on by, which is a blessing. Mm-hmm. Blessed be. We've recorded in three different nooks this year. Oh my gosh. All kinds of nooks and crannies. <laughs> Am I having a stroke too? <laughs> <laughs>